you're not the boss of me. Uh, the last little bit, Sharon and I have been spending a lot of time with our grandkids. And for the most part, they get along quite well. But every once in a while, you hear a phrase, something like, you're not the boss of me. Now, we live in an age where uh, a personal freedom is greatly stressed. And you're not the boss of me could be summarize, it could summarize the highest value of our culture. Years from now, our generation might be summed up as a time when everybody did what they saw uh, as they saw fit. And that's not a new attitude. Uh, the, the closing words of the book of Judges are exactly that, that uh, people did as they saw fit. Today, we're starting a new series, Choose Your King, based upon 1 Samuel. I've been telling people for years I wanted to do this. And so here it is uh, in the Hebrew Bible. First and Second Samuel. Did I say Kings before? Samuel. It's for, um, we're doing a series on First Samuel. So in the Hebrew Bible, First and Second Samuel actually one book, and they appear immediately after the Book of Judges. The Book of Ruth is not in between. So the last thing you read before you read the Book of Samuel is uh, is the last verse of Judges, and it says, "In those days, Israel had no king." All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And in, in many ways, the book of Samuel is a solution to the anarchy of the time of the judges. When Samuel starts, there is no king. When it ends, they have a king. The last verses of Judges are true. Israel had no king, but that is because they refused to acknowledge God as their king. The Lord was the king of Israel. But the real problem wasn't the lack of king, but the lack of Israel's obedience to God as their king. And so, in the book of Samuel, Israel asks for a king. God re, uh, recognizes or feels that that request is like a rejection of his rule. And Israel gets the king they ask for, Saul. But when Saul's reign is over, we're left wondering, are they any better off at all having had this king? And then even with the rise and rule of David, it proves to be a mixed blessing. The king, the greatest king that Israel ever had, and it's a mixed, a mixed bag. So the message of the book of Samuel looks forward. It's always looking forward to that good and perfect king that's coming. Israel's kings were anointed with oil, so they were known as the anointed one, or in Hebrew, as the Messiah, in Greek, the Christ. The disastrous reign of Saul, the king that Israel asked for, and the flawed reign of David, the king that God gives as a gift or as a blessing to his people, all point us forward to the true and better king, the true and better Christ. The one man who rules God's people the way God wants. So as we work our way through the book of 1 Samuel, we will continually look forward. We'll be drawn forward to that perfect Christ, the true Messiah, the true King that's coming. So let's get started. Our text for today is uh, Samuel chapter 1, uh, up to 2, verse 11. And each week, I'll put in the bulletin uh, the text for uh, next week's sermon. This week, it's in the, it, on the insert. You'll see what the passage is for next week. And today, our sermon is called, The King is Coming. Now, when you look at the church today, the church in Western, the Western world, what do you see? When you look at our society, our present culture, what do you see? It's hard to avoid the sense that in some ways there's a crisis. God is not acknowledged. His ways are not followed. His people are ridiculed. The church seems to be struggling or losing ground. And as I already said, the book of Judges ends with this line. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And as I said, that could be the motto for our age. You can make up your own morality. You can decide for yourself what's right and what's wrong. Four times in the final chapters of the book of Judges, we are told, and Israel had no king. So 1 Samuel opens with these words. It says, 
there was a certain man. And by the way, there's only one other time in the Old Testament where those, that, a story opens that way, and that's the story of uh, Samson. There was a certain man, and we're tempted to think, oh, this is going to be the king that's coming forward. This certain man is this king. But it quickly becomes obvious that he is not. In fact, the story of Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel, starts not with the story of a would-be king, but of a woman caught in deep grief and sorrow. Let me quickly tell you the story. The story is about a certain man, Elkanah, who had two wives. His first wife's name is Hannah. Her name means favored. She is favored because she is the favorite wife. But, but, and this is a big but. She, that didn't come out right. <laughs> she was barren. She could not have children. And then the second wife, her name was Penina. And her name means fruitful, and that's what she was. The Bible says she had sons and daughters. She had lots of kids. And each year, the whole family would pack up and go to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was, to the house of the Lord, uh, to worship God. So, husband, two wives, all of her kids, and off they go. And this became a painful event each year for Hannah, because Penina would ridicule her uh, because she had no children. You know, you're favorite of God. How has God favored you? You don't have any kids. And she would ridicule her to the point of deep anguish where Hannah couldn't eat. This is not a happy family. This went on year after year until one year in bitterness of soul, Hannah got up, went to the house of the Lord and made a vow. And her vow was this. God, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you for a life of service as a Nazarite. Eli the priest saw her praying in bitterness, and he accused her of being drunk. And she assured him that she wasn't drunk, that she was crying out to the Lord in bitterness of soul. And he said to her, may God bless you with what you've asked for. Now, one commentator notes that the spiritual condition in Israel was so low that the priest would expect a drunken person to be staggering around the tabernacle rather than somebody praying in anguish. He couldn't even recognize someone who was there praying. Now, true to his word, to Eli's word, Hannah goes home, becomes pregnant. She gives birth to a son. That son's name is Samuel. Uh, three years in, he is weaned, taken back to the house of the Lord, and he is raised as Eli's adopted son. Because Eli's true sons are wicked, and they are not fit to be priests. And Samuel becomes Eli's adopted son, and even though he isn't from the tribe of the priests, he starts to perform the function of a true priest. Now, chapter 2 is a song or a prayer that Hannah sings. When she comes to the back and gives Eli Samuel for a life of service, she prays this prayer. It's not the prayer that you would expect a noon mother to pray, uh, about breaking the bows of, of the enemy. And I'll, I'm going to have Andrew come and read for us. This is her prayer when she's dedicating Samuel. reading from the book of 1 Samuel. Then Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Stop acting so proud and haughty. Don't speak with such arrogance, for the Lord is a God who knows what you have done. He will judge your actions. The bow of the mighty is now broken, and those who stumbled are now strong. Those who were well fed are now starving, and those who were starving are now full. The childless woman now has seven children, and the woman with many children wastes away. 
The Lord gives both death and life. He brings some down to the grave, but raises others up. The Lord makes some poor and others rich. He brings some down and lifts others up. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among princes, placing them in seats of honor. For all the earth is the Lord's, and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. Those who fight against the Lord will be shattered. He thunders against them from heaven. The Lord judges throughout the earth. He gives power to the king, his king. He increases the strength of his anointed one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now this whole story, uh, from the beginning of chapter 1 to the end where, uh, where uh, Andrew read, is, uses a common Hebrew pattern or trick for writing. It, it's called a chiastic pattern. And normally it has an odd number of points. And the first point and the, uh, and the last point are parallel. Uh, can we go to that next slide? Oh, I did. Okay. So uh, on the first point, he, uh, the family travels to Shiloh. On the last point, they're traveling back home. On the second and the second last, Hannah's prayer of mercy, Hannah's prayer of thanksgiving or joy, and so on till you get to the center point. And the center point is the most important part of the story. So the story here begins with Hannah, a barren woman. Why is she unable to have children? Well, verse 15 tells us, or verse 5, the Lord had closed her womb. God is sovereign, and he is sovereign over our suffering. We need to think about that. God is sovereign, but he's sovereign over our suffering. Whatever the medical cause for her barrenness, Ultimately, it was God who closed her womb. The key is how do we respond to that? For Penina, it was reason to mock Hannah mercilessly. For, for Elkanah, Elkina, it was uh, reason to pity her. He says, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Sounds a little defensive, doesn't it? For Hannah, it was a reason to pray, to cry out. If God had closed her womb, God could open it. Up to this point, Hannah has been passive, but now she stands up, goes to the tabernacle, and cries out to God. Look at some of the words that are used in this uh, story to describe her and her prayer. Verse 10, deep anguish. Bitter weeping. Verse 11, misery. Verse 15, deeply troubled. Verse 16, great anguish and grief. Now, if you are experiencing deep anguish and deep grief in your life right now, you might feel that you cannot pray. But I want you to know that you're in a good place to pray well. Sometimes life hurts so much that we can't even focus, we can't even think, we can't even put a sentence together. People have told me off, and I go to visit in the hospital, people say, Russ, you've got to pray for me because I can't pray. I can't concentrate hard enough to put words together into a proper sentence. But I want you to know that in that kind of condition, you're in a good place to pray good prayers. For you see, prayer isn't about getting the right words in order. It's about verse 15, pouring out your soul to the Lord. The favored one is now favored. She becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son. His name is Samuel. For she said, I asked the Lord from him. This is verse 20. Now the name Samuel actually means his name is God. But there's a Hebrew word for, uh, the Hebrew word for ask for is sal-el. Sal-el. It's close enough for Hannah's explanation to make sense. Samuel is the child that was asked for. Now, there's a play on words going through this whole chapter around this whole idea of being asked for. 
It runs through this whole, uh, whole story. In verse 17, the priest says, she bless, he blesses Hannah with these, with, with these words. He says, may God give you the asking that you asked for. In effect, he's saying, may God Samuel you, or may God give you the Samuel you have Samuel. Later in Samuel's dedication, Hannah uses the word four times. He, he, she says, the Lord has granted me the asking that I asked for. Now I give the response to my asking to the Lord. For he, for his whole life, he will be given in response to my asking of the Lord. She repeats that word four times. What is the point the writer is making by repeating this word ask for over and over and over again in chapter one? The, the point is Hannah asks and God gives. God answers prayer. She cries out in deep anguish and God answers. But there's much more going on here. This is a foretaste of what to come. For Sa'al is actually even closer to another Hebrew name, the name Saul. Saul is the king that Samuel will anoint because the people have asked for a king. The word asked for is repeated over and over and over and over again in chapter 1, and then it's not used again until chapter 8 when the elders ask for a king. Now, the book of First and Second Samuel are dominated by three characters. Samuel, Saul, and David. Samuel is the son that Hannah asked for. Saul is the king the people of Israel asked for. But who's David? Who's David? So let's turn our attention now to Hannah's prayer. Hannah's story is told not to illustrate ordinary life, the application is not that every childless woman who cries out in prayer, desperate to God, that God is going to answer and give her a baby. Hannah's story is told because there's something much bigger, something extraordinary that's going on. When, God, when Hannah prays and says, look upon your servant's misery, what she is doing is she's using the words that, that God applied to Israel at the Exodus. Uh, the people of Israel were caught in Egypt, caught in slavery. And it says, and God looked and saw their misery. She is echoing those words. Israel was caught in slavery and the Lord says, I have indeed seen their misery. Hannah's name means favored, but she wasn't favored. She was barren. Israel in the same way was the chosen people, but they were not favored because they were caught in slavery. In the time of Judges, Israel is in turmoil. Just as Hannah is barren, so is Israel. They are not bearing any fruit. Now, I want you to notice an important thing that happens. It takes place in verse 23. This verse happens between the time when Samuel was born and Samuel is dedicated, those three years. Uh, the family continued to go up to Shiloh each year to worship. And Hannah said, I'm going to stay back. I'm going to stay back with Samuel until he is weaned. And then I will take him up and, and give him to the Lord for a life of service. And her husband replies, verse 23, do what, you, uh, do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah said. Um, stay here until you have weaned him. May, only may the Lord make good his word. You know, okay, what? what does it mean that the Lord will make good his word? Hannah is the one who's made the vow. She's the one who has to keep her promise. God hasn't made a promise in this story. What is this promise? What does it mean that God would keep his word? The answer is the word that the Lord is to keep is the word that he has given to his people. God has promised to bless his people and make them a blessing to all the people in the whole world. And it seems here that Hannah's husband suspects that what is happening to Hannah is part of that larger picture of what God has promised to do. He is remembering Israel and he is keeping his covenant. 
In verse 19, we see it says the Lord remembered Hannah. That's the same word that is, that is used when God remembered Israel when they were in Egypt in slavery. God is, uh, the, the word remembered means that God is acting according to his covenant promise. Just as he remembered Israel, he now remembers Hannah. And he is beginning that, uh, that's a new stage in this whole redemptive passage. And so in the passage that Andrew read for us, Hannah has returned to the place where she cried out in anguish to God. But now she's come to sing a, thong, a song of thanksgiving. Now, as I said, you don't expect a new mother's song to be about breaking uh, warriors' bows and about God judging the ends of the earth and God giving strength to his king. It's a bit of a strange song, right? Now, what's the deal with this song? Well, the deal is, in the first chapter, we've been receiving hints that more is going on. But in this song, it's made explicit. Hannah's story is a picture of Israel's story. And indeed, a picture of humanity's story. Like Hannah, we are barren and fruitless, spiritually speaking. But the movement in Hannah's story is from one of, of uh, lifelessness, barrenness, to a life of fruitfulness. We see God bringing life where there is no life. Like Hannah, we are beset with our enemies. Israel's enemies at the time were the Philistines. They were very powerful. Our enemies, sin and death. But the movement in Hannah's story is from a woman provoked by her rival to a woman who can say, my mouth boasts over my enemies. I delight in your deliverance. Hannah's story is full of reversals. For example, in chapter 1, she's downhearted, but now... Her song begins, my heart rejoices. In chapter 1, she's crying in anguish, but now she is boasting over her enemies. Elkanah's family is a miniature version of Israel, divided between the high and the low, between the proud and the humble, or the humbled. Hannah's story is the plot of the book of Samuel in miniature. What God has done for Hannah is a picture of, of what he is going to do for Israel. It's also a picture of what he's going to do for you. In chapter 4 to 10, Hannah lists a whole series of reversals that clearly go beyond her personal experience to the experience of the people of Israel as a whole. Hannah's story, or her song, serves as a key to interpreting the books of First and Second Samuel. And so in this series, we'll keep coming back to her song. Let me give you one example. Verse 9. It is not by strength that one prevails. In the story that we're going to see come out in 1 Samuel, it is always not by human strength. It's by divine power. Verse 7. The Lord humbles and he exalts. This idea sets the agenda for the book of, of, um, of 1 Samuel. The first time King Saul is uh, introduced, he is described as a person who is a head taller than everyone else. But at the end of the book, he is lying flat, killed in the battlefield. And David cries out, Oh, how the mighty have fallen. By contrast, the first time David is introduced, he's introduced as the youngest or smallest of Jesse's children. And yet at the end of the book, end of 2 Samuel, he is singing like Hannah is now singing, you have exalted me over my foes. Hannah's story is told because it is part of the bigger picture. It's the story of God providing a Savior. Hannah's son Samuel will reestablish God's rule over God's people, replacing the corrupt sons of Eli. He will deliver the people from their enemies and judge them with justice. Sounds like something God's promised to do through Jesus, isn't it? Hannah's story is also a picture of the church in our generation. We are the favored, chosen by God, but we appear to be barren. In most of the West, we lack children in the sense of any converts, certainly in any significant numbers. In fact, like Hannah, we are mocked and ridiculed by our rivals. 
We need Hannah's story and Hannah's song as a reminder that the gospel will triumph and God will vindicate his name. In the, in the meantime, what should we do? Well, Samuel 1 verse 10. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. This is what we are to do. Our church's barrenness, our weakness, should turn us to the Lord in desperate prayer, not away from him in defeat. Hannah ends her songs with this, her song with these words. Uh, this is verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 10. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. You know what's strange about her saying that? When she says that, Israel doesn't have a king. In fact, they've never had a king. So what's she talking about? What she is talking about is God's king is coming. And when he comes, he's going to turn the world upside down. Her song points forward to the coming Christ. Now, before we end, one more thing. Hannah's personal experience of barrenness is not unique in God's story of redemption. She's not the first barren woman in the Bible to miraculously receive a child. In fact, each one of the starting patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their wives Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, all three of them barren. The parallels with Rachel are striking. Both Hannah and Rachel are their husband's favorite. Both of them have a rival who is able to have lots of children. And both are ridiculed for not having kids. The parallels do not end with the patriarchs. Samson, remember we talked about this certain man? That was the beginning of the story of Samson. Samson was also born to a, a woman who was previously barren. And like, uh, like Samson, uh, Samuel is a permanent Nazarene, or Nazarite, sorry, Nazarite. A Nazarite were those guys who didn't cut their hair, didn't uh, drink alcohol, and didn't get close to dead bodies. So there's three permanent, uh, like, and so sometimes people took this on for a short period of time, but there's three guys in the Bible that they, they were to do this from, from birth to death. Three permanent Nazarites. You know who they are? Samson, Samuel, and New, New Testament, John the Baptist, who is also born to a previously barren woman. The parallels between Hannah and Elizabeth, John's mother, are particularly significant. If Elizabeth is the new Hannah, then John the Baptist is the new Samuel. Samuel prepared the way for King David. John the Baptist prepared the way for the son of David, for the Christ, for Jesus. All the way through the story, God gives children to barren women. It's clear what his lesson is. His lesson is salvation will be accomplished only through God's power and grace. God promised to Abraham that he would be the father of a nation, and through that nation, God would bless the whole world. But if Abraham can't have children, that promise goes nowhere. Right from the very beginning, it looks like God picked the wrong couple. But God chose barren women to demonstrate that from the very beginning to the end, his salvation would be accomplished through his power and grace, not through ours. Time after time, God chooses barren women to play a part in the bloodline of his Savior, of the Savior. And when it comes to the actual birth of the Savior, he goes one step farther, one step better than that. For the Savior is born of a virgin. This is the ultimate demonstration that salvation comes through God's power. Now, like Hannah... Mary sings a song in response to becoming pregnant. Hannah sings the song when she's dedicating Samuel. Mary sings the song when she discovers that she's pregnant with, uh, with, uh, with Jesus. Now, what's interesting is Mary's song is an echo of Hannah's song. Both songs show a picture 
of a God who will do something for his people. Both describe a series of reversals. What happened to Hannah is the beginning of the story of the rise of David to his throne. What happened to Mary is the beginning of the story of the rise of Jesus to his throne. God's king is coming, and when he comes, he's going to turn this world upside down. Notice what Hannah sings. This is verses 6 and 7. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and rises, raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. Look at those verses and think of Jesus. Jesus takes those who are dead in sin and gives them new life in his name. He takes those weighed down by guilt and lifts them up and seats them with him in glory. He brings down to judgment those who proudly defy him, and he exalts those who humbly submit themselves to God. The question that this story, Hannah's story, leaves us with is, what side are you on? There's two kingdoms, the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of his king. There are two types of people, those who defy God and those uh, and ignore him, and those who humbly bow before his king, before God's king. Maybe you've made gospel choices that mean that you cannot afford the same lifestyle as your neighbors. Maybe you have chosen to give your time to serve others rather than to indulge yourself. Maybe this summer, instead of taking holidays, you chose to work at a camp. Or as a student, instead of earning money to go to university, you worked at a camp. Maybe you speak up for Christ, even though it harms your career. The message of the story of of Hannah and Hannah's song is this. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it because God's king is coming, and when he comes, he will turn this world upside down. What is lost in this life will be gained in eternity. Some time ago, someone said to me, Okay, Russ, you've given your life as service to God. And in response to that, God lets your son die. Do you still think it's worth it to serve him? Huh? You think it's worth it? Is it worth it? It's worth it because God's king is coming. And when he comes, he's going to turn this world upside down. And what's lost in this life will be gained for eternity. Hannah sings, the Lord humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. That, my friends, is your future if you humble yourself before God. How do we know? Because God, Jesus set the path. He went before us. He left heaven to take on the form of a servant. He was obedient. He humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. Notice, look, look at these verses and think about Jesus. At the cross, Jesus was brought down to the grave, verse 6. He was made humble. He was humiliated, verse 7. But God made him alive, verse 6, and raised him from the grave, verse 7. God seated him on a throne of honor, verse 8. Jesus was brought lower than Hannah. He was brought lower than you and I ever will be. And yet God has raised him to a place and given him a name that is higher than any other name. Do you see that these verses that Hannah's song is about Jesus? Do you see that? You're allowed to talk. Do you see that? Do you see that that song is about Jesus? You're not quite convinced, eh? Is that about Jesus? Did God do those things? Hey, it's not just about Jesus. It's about you. What God will do for you. His king is coming, and when his king comes, he's going to turn the world upside down. That song 
is about God's plan for you. So is it worth it? When life gets hard and obeying God and following God is hard, is it worth it? Is it? Okay, if that stuff's true, then it's worth it. God's king is coming. And when he comes, he's going to turn the world upside down. God wants to do amazing things for his people. I think we're going to sing some more to celebrate this.